All right, friends. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I hope everyone has had an amazing time waking up, and I'm glad that you are here. Welcome to Leadership Institute's Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast. My name is Stephen Rowe, and I'm the director of digital training at Leadership Institute, and I am uh, not Morton, but in the famous words of an extremely wise man, we live in interesting times. And there's been a lot that has happened over the course of last night. Of course, we went through a bunch of primaries and August is heating up. We're gonna have quite a few primaries on the road, but we had five yesterday. And for people waking up, looking for the news, just wanna give you the highlights of what happened yesterday. And so five states. Number one, we had Arizona, where it seems Kerry Lake is going to be victorious. Blake Masters also uh, seems to have secured the nomination. In Kansas, the pro-life movement unfortunately took a small setback, but of course patience is a virtue and good things are on the horizon, but the amendment had failed. In Michigan, we have Tudor Dixon, who's gonna be facing off after she received the, nom the uh, endorsement of President Trump. She'll be facing off against Gretchen Whitmer. She's a, she's a handful, right? Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. Whew, that's a, that's a lot there. Also in Michigan, uh, Peter Meyer, uh, famously voted to impeach Donald Trump and has lost uh, his seat to John Gibbs. Yay! Michigan, uh, excuse me, Missouri, the show me state. And uh, of course, famously on Monday, Trump endorsed Eric. We weren't sure, we weren't sure which one, but Eric won. Uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, the attorney general, uh, has won and we'll see what happens there now in Missouri. Um, it's gonna be pretty exciting to see. And then Washington, the evergreen state. Uh, we still have a lot going on there. It's a pretty unique system uh, in the state of Washington where uh, the top two vote getters on each side will advance to the general election. Um, so it remains to be seen ultimately what's gonna happen in Washington, um, but we're paying close attention to it. Uh, and so there was a lot of things happening, but now looking forward, of course, there's still 10 more uh, primary uh, elections and, and, and 10 more states, excuse me, over the course of the month of August. We're less than 100 days away uh, from election day now, and things will only start to heat up in the month of August. It's not just the humidity outside, it's politics across this country. And surely here at Leadership Institute, we believe that the winner of a political contest over time is determined by the number of effective activists on the respective side. So in front of you, you'll find a bunch of training, uh, training opportunities. It'll be an amazing yellow sheet. We've got a lot coming up. As a personal favor uh, to me, really encourage you to share the upcoming trainings with the friends, and it really helps going to spread our movement and growing and training our activists. Surely, the difference between a trained activist and somebody who's just starting is light years. It's almost, I always like to compare it to someone entering the military for the first time is very excited, but they're not quite a Navy SEAL. They're not quite an Army Ranger. And we wanna turn soldiers into super soldiers, so to speak, in the, political po uh, in the public policy process. Uh, so, glad that you are here. I encourage you to live tweet today's event, and the hashtag is on the screen, hashtag WWCB. And in 2022, your Leadership Institute has already trained 4,786 conservatives in 180 separate programs. Since 1979, LI has trained more than 250,000 activists, students, and leaders. And I really encourage you, if you're watching online, to visit our website at leadershipinstitute.org forward slash training to see upcoming online and in-person training. Well, now it is my pleasure to invite Grace Steiger uh, up here to the do the pledge and invocation. Grace is the events intern here at the Leadership Institute. She is from Bothell, Washington, and attends college at Whitworth University. She is pursuing her degree in elementary education with an emphasis on reading and English language learners. On campus, Grace is the secretary for Students for Life, and she's working on chartering a network of enlightened women's chapter where she will serve as secretary, as well as a Turning Point USA chapter where she will serve as president. Outside of school, Grace enjoys traveling, baking, and spending time with family and friends. Uh, Grace, if you'd like to join us. All right, if everyone would bow their heads, please. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and for bringing everyone here safely this morning. 
Thank you for Cleta Mitchell and her willingness to come speak to us all today. Please bless her as she speaks and give us the ears to listen to what she has to say as well. Thank you for this community of Wednesday Wake Up Breakfast attendees that support the mission of the Leadership Institute and bless each person as they go about their day today. We love you and are thankful for all you do for us. In your name, I pray. Amen. And then if, any, if everyone could please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you, Grace. It is now my pleasure to introduce Cl Kelton Clardy. Uh, Kelton is the Leadership Institute's Deputy National Field Director at the Leadership Institute. In this role, he helps manage the field staff while taking on other various projects. In the fall of 2019, Kelton served as the Leadership Institute's Field Representative for the state of Illinois. Illinois, that's always a fun state. Uh, governors there always seem to serve two terms, one term in office, one term in jail. Uh, for asking for the governor's cell number, it's actually cell block D6 at your local penitentiary, not a cell phone. Um, but where he was able to organize more than 1,700 conservative slash libertarian students across the state by hosting more than 100 activism events, more than 30 speakers, and creating 15 new student organizations on campus. After his success as a field representative, he was brought on as a regional field coordinator and later promoted to deputy national field director where he serves today and does a fantastic job. Throughout his time at the Leadership Institute, Kelton has helped to start over 200 organizations. He's identified nearly 10,000 conservative students and taught in various trainings nationwide. Kelton, please. Thank you so much, Stephen. So we've actually had a very exciting time um, in CLP lately. So this week and last, LI hosted 42 field representative candidates for a 10-day training. At this training, LI staff narrowed the candidate pool down and placed 20 field representatives in 23 states. However, after evaluating the field rep class, Morton decided to hire five more candidates and expand the program to 25 field reps working across 27 states. So actually, we are very lucky and joined by the 25 field representatives today. So I'm gonna ask you all to stand and we can give them a round of applause. <laughs> They've all worked very, very hard, and we have put them through the ringer these past eight days. And so they're probably very tired and looking forward to a very good breakfast. So you guys can all have a seat. Thank you so much. So the exciting part is these new LI field reps are going to work on college campuses across the country for the next 10 months to identify, recruit, and train conservative students to stand up for leaders of conservative values on their campus. In two key states, however, we're very excited. In Texas and Florida, we're going to have a dedicated team of five full-time field staff focused on identifying and training conservative students on campuses across those two states. Lastly, I want to thank all of the generous donors in this room. What we do in the National Field Program would absolutely not be possible without your consistent support for us. And I want to say how excited I am to go in this semester and work with all of these wonderful new field staff we have. And thank you all for your time. Thank you. Amazing and, and necessary work. Surely we realize the left, students, administrators, faculty are not sharing a conservative message online or in person or in a classroom. And if they won't, we will. So thank you to the field reps taking uh, college campuses by storm and helping activate conservative students and groups across this uh, country. So now it's my pleasure to introduce McKennan Rice uh, to introduce our speaker. McKennan is the communications training intern here at Leadership Institute. McKennan is from Austin, Texas, where he attends the University of Texas, seeking two majors in both economics and history. On campus, McKennan serves as the outreach officer for his Young Conservatives of Texas chapter. In this role, he supports the organization's goal to get students involved in the conservative movement and to make a home for them on campus. McKennan has interned for the Texas State Legislator and before coming to Leadership Institute, he finished an internship with the Texas Public Policy Foundation and he plans to go into fundraising after he graduates. McKennan, if you would join us. Good 
Good morning, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce all of y'all to Cleta Mitchell, our speaker. Uh, with more than 40 years' experience in law, politics, and public policy, Cleta is one of the most influential and effective lawyers here in D.C. and in America. Uh, Cleta is an attorney licensed in both the District of Columbia and in Oklahoma, where she went to school at OU, the University of Oklahoma, and is a Longhorn. She said she wouldn't hold it against me, so I won't hold against her that she's a Sooner. She also went there to get her law degree, and she was a member of the Oklahoma House of Representatives from Lincolnshire, uh, 1976 to 1984, where she uh, chaired both the House Appropriations Committee and the Budget Committee, which is pretty incredible. Went on to represent numerous campaigns, candidates, and members of Congress. Uh, she then served as counsel for the National Rifle Association in a Supreme Court case in 2002. Mitchell served on many boards and councils, but most importantly, the Advisory Council to the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Election Law and its advisor to the American Law Institute, the Election Laws Project entitled Principles of Law Election or Election Law Despite Resolution. In 2016, she was elected to be a member in the American Law Institute. In the past, she's been a chairman of the American Conservative Union Foundation and has served as the president of the Republican National Lawyers Association. Uh, she is a senior level, uh, legal fellow at CPI for lecture integrity, and she has a long history of fighting for lecture integrity, including uh, she has fought against Obama's IRS uh, when it attacked Tea Party members in early 2010s, and she was recently a volunteer on Trump's legal team in 2020 in Georgia. Um, she has written a number of journals and has recently written a book um, about lobbying compliance titled uh, the Lobbying Compliance Handbook. And we share a birthday on September 16th. Everyone, Cleta Mitchell. Well, good morning. It's great to see everybody. And I did tell McKinnon, you know, I am a Sooner. I'm Sooner born and Sooner bred, and when I die, I'll be Sooner dead. And, um, <clears throat> But I will not hold it against him for being a Longhorn. I thank you for uh, that introduction. I just always love to come here, but I'm specifically thrilled to be here to get to see all these new field reps and to think about the work that they're going to be doing and to see all of you and, and hear these young people um, and how impressive they are. So congratulations to all of you. I'm going to put you to work. <laughs> I've got another chore for you. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk this morning about 2020 and about 2022 and about saving the elections in our country because I think that that's something that, that we really have to think about and focus on and do something about. I mean, I'm old enough to remember 2000 and hanging chads and it was okay then, right, for the left and the media to all want to prolong and recount and keep recounting in Florida, and that was okay. And I remember um, the bumper stickers in 2004, re-defeat Bush. Remember those? Some of us remember those. They never agreed. They, thought, they said the Supreme Court manipulated and handed the election to George W. Bush and that Al Gore was the real winner of that election. I remember that. I remember Congress passing a federal law, the Help America Vote Act, to change out voting machines and voting processes because the left and the Democrats said that we cheated somehow in, the, in uh, 2000. But that was all okay, right? It's okay if they're the ones that say that. I remember in 2016, um, the absolute meltdown of the left. And remember the Russia collusion hoax that there are literally millions of moronic Democrats who still will tell you that Trump only won because of Russian collusion, which was a complete hoax, which cost us as taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars and which the media fixated on. People won Pulitzer Prizes for writing about something that was absolutely flagrantly false. But come 2020, and uh, President Trump looking at the elections, and I was called, I was actually in Montana for the election. Um, I had represented uh, Senator Daines and the Republican Party of Montana, and so I went out there for Election Day because I've run Election Day operations and worked on Election Day uh, activities and war rooms and all for many, many years. I was in my car the day after the election, getting, you know, putting in the coordinates to get back to the airport in Bozeman, 
after a very wonderful night in Montana where Republicans won everything. It was 100% red, except for the court system. I got to tell you, the court system in Montana, for some unknown reason, is so liberal that you cannot get a fair shake if you're a conservative or Republican going to court in Montana on anything related to elections. But I was literally putting in the coordinates to go back to North Carolina, where I now live, and I got a call from Mark Meadows saying, where are you? I said, well, I'm in Bozeman, Montana. Where are you? And he said, uh, can you go to Georgia? He said, I, wanna see, I want someone there that I can t try to see what's going on there. And I, <clears throat> so I changed my flight, literally went to the airport, changed my flight, flew into Atlanta, got there, and started looking at what had happened in the election. And when I got there, and for the first couple of several days, Trump was ahead, but that kept coming down, kept coming down, kept coming down. Literally a week after the election is when Biden went ahead. Can you believe that? I mean, it, that we didn't know on election night. So, but I started looking at the issues of the election and how it was conducted. I'm an election lawyer. I, I know that if you want to challenge an election, you cannot just go in and say, we think this was wrong or that was wrong. You have to be able to go in and say, we think this illegal, this vote was illegal, this vote was illegal. You have to know and you have to document and you have to include that uh, in any kind of contest. And there is a code, a, an election code in every state that allows for uh, contests, election contests and sets forth what the provisions are for challenging the outcome of an election. There's a timetable and there's a process and there are the statutory grounds laid out. And so we began to, we had a group of volunteers. We didn't have any money. We didn't have, I mean, the RNC was raising money hand over fist for uh, fighting for the president and all. We didn't have any of that money. Now, ultimately, the lawyers in Georgia, I, at least it got them to pay those guys, I didn't get paid anything, but um, <clears throat> but we had our little team. We called our volunteer team. People, you know, we had volunteers who came, and there were about there were seven of us. <laughs> we called ourselves the Team Deplorables, um, and and we started. We had people who were experts that we found who came in and helped us look at the available data from uh, various government lists, from the post office, the voter registration rolls, the. And we started looking, and let me just give you this one example. We, can, we identified over 30 categories of illegal votes because people had voted. Well, I'll give you this. The final, final uh, margin between uh, President Trump and Joe Biden in Georgia, and it was the third number, by the way, the third time. They never could come up with the same number a second time, much less three times. And the, every time they did any kind of recount they didn't ever do a real recount but um because <clears throat> they just ran, would run it through the machines but they had counties in georgia that literally could not replicate the results that, that they already turned in and the secretary of states uh the secretary of state told them well just turn in whatever and we'll decide which one we're going to pick i'm not making this up that's what they said we now when you have an election you're supposed to be able to replicate the results no matter how many times you do it, right? They couldn't, there were counties in Georgia that could not do that. They could not even get the machines and the calculations to come out. They couldn't, they could not certify a second time. And, the, and so the Secretary of State's response was, well, just send in a number and we'll decide which one to use. Great way to conduct an election, right? But the final, actual tally was 11,779 votes difference between President Trump and Joe Biden. We found 18,325 votes that were cast from registrations that were actually vacant lots. Now that's not a real vote. That's not a real person. And we had another 904 uh, ballots cast from people who were registered to vote at post office boxes. We had nearly, we had over, we estimated in our lawsuit about 40,000 people who voted illegally because they had moved out of their county more than 30 days 
before the election. And the law in Georgia is that you cannot go back and vote in your old county. You have to re-register and vote in your new county. And that was in a lawsuit. We put all this together. We filed an election contest in state court in Fulton County, Georgia, because we were required by law that that was the venue in which we had to file. We filed that on December the 4th of 2020, and we never got a judge appointed to hear the case. We never got a day in court. So when the media reports that President Trump lost all of his lawsuits, well, he didn't lose ours because we never got a day in court. And, and now, because of my role in helping to document and, and be put together the lawsuit that we filed, I get to go testify before the grand jury in Fulton County, Georgia, because they are investigating our efforts, efforts of people to alter, to manipulate or somehow alter the election, to interfere with the conduct of an election. Now the election was over. We filed a lawsuit pursuant to Georgia law, but they get away with coming after lawyers like me because we followed the law and exercised rights on behalf of President Trump and the campaign uh, under the laws of the state of Georgia. I've had, I've had uh, a, a, an ethics complaint filed against me with the Oklahoma Bar Association by 29 lawyers, none of whom I've ever met or heard of. I couldn't pick one of them out of a lineup. I checked and half of them are Biden donors. And so I've had to go defend myself uh, at the Oklahoma Bar Association. David Brock, that great uh, destroyer of America, <clears throat> has organized this thing called Project 65, where he has targeted every lawyer who has done, who was in any way involved with representing President Trump and filed ethics complaints against over 100 lawyers. So I haven't heard from the uh, Bar Association in the District of Columbia. They have historically had a policy that they would not um, entertain ethics complaints against lawyers unless there was some relationship, a lawyer-client relationship that the lawyer had with whoever was filing the complaint. Now, they just announced they're waiving that policy as it relates to John Eastman and Jeffrey Clark. You know what their sins were? Jeffrey Clark wrote a memo in which he outlined what he thought the federal law required the Justice Department to review and investigate when there were allegations of election fraud. There's an entire section of the election code, of the criminal code, in the United States uh, statutes dealing with election crimes. I have spoken <laughs> at the Department of Justice training programs on election crimes. There's a, that's a real thing. And he wrote a memo based on that, and now they are trying to destroy him. They're trying to destroy him. Dr. John Eastman, who is one of the most brilliant constitutional lawyers uh, in the country, but he's conservative for his entire career. He has been putting together, trying to find and hold together a network of conservative law professors and conservative political science professors um, and, and try to make sure that there are more of them than can fit, we used to say in a phone booth, but since there's so many young people who don't know what phone booths are, <laughs> who could fit an elevator, how about that? Um, his sin, his sin, was that he wrote a memo, which I asked, I reached out to him. I had legislators, I represented at the time the American Legislative Exchange Council, and we had legislators saying, what is our role in all of this? <clears throat> what authority do we have? Well, it turns out the Constitution grants plenary authority to state legislator, legislatures to select the electors. There's nothing in the Constitution about letting the people vote. Nothing. The Constitution says the state legislatures shall select the electors. So he wrote a memo 
that received wide distribution for as to what the legislative authority is under the Constitution and under the case law over the past 200, almost 250 years. And then his, had, his interpretation was that the vice president could actually ask for additional time for states to uh, basically understand and finalize and investigate to see if their election results were actually accurate. And for that, he, was, he lost his job. He retired, took early retirement from the position he, uh, had, uh, he held at Chapman University uh, Law School as chair of the Constitutional Law Center, um, <clears throat> moved to Santa Fe where people, he, his home is on a, um, in, in a little re re more remote area on a dirt road, and so these lefties keep putting spikes in his driveway so that he's, he and his wife have lost, you know, four sets of tires. Um, and they drive by his house all hours of the day and night, you know, screaming at him, and they painted the bridges near him. And the police will help him, not at all, because they're, they're, he's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I said, well, you couldn't have picked a more liberal place to go, except maybe Aspen or, or, or Austin. Um, but, and, you know, because of my role with the president, um, the, that Lincoln Project came after me, came after our law firm, and uh, started having corporate corporations calling uh, their partner uh, at our law firm, who was their relationship partner, saying, telling them that if they didn't fire me, that the corporation would have to terminate my law firm. And I thought, you know, I don't want to deal with this anymore, so I left, but I joined the Conservative Partnership Institute, which is a whole lot better than being at a big, fancy law firm, I can tell you that. But my point in telling you all of this is to say that the Democrats and the left are intent upon punishing anyone who believes that there were problems in the 2020 election. And we used to have a state U.S. senator uh, in, uh, from Oklahoma in the early 60s who, um, who he, he, he started out okay, became a real lefty, unfortunately, over time. But he used to, he was a great speaker, Fred Harris. If Morton were here, he would remember Fred Harris. And uh, he used to give, uh, he, some of the things, one of the things he used to always say in speeches is there are people in America who think that if you just give poor people enough advice, they'll quit it. <laughs> they'll just quit being poor. And that's the way the media is about those of us who say there were problems in the 2020 election. They think if they just say over and over and over again that there was nothing to see, nothing was wrong, everything was fine, it was the big lie. They think that somehow that if they say that enough that we'll start believing them. Well, I want to tell you something. It isn't a lie. There were problems in Georgia. We do not know with certainty. The president gets mad at me for saying that. You know which president I'm talking about, right? Uh, <clears throat> because he wants me to t say you know, I, that he won by 400,000 votes. And I keep telling him, we don't know who won Georgia. Because there are more illegal votes included in the certified results than the margin of victory between President Trump and Joe Biden. And you know what? That's true for Arizona. It's true for Wisconsin. It's true for Pennsylvania. It's probably true for Michigan and Nevada. And, and since 2020, we have, <coughs> excuse me, documented, you know, the media only in Arizona, the Arizona audit, they only printed and told the story of one small part of that audit report, which was the hand count of the paper ballots. And that, said, that showed that Biden actually, in Maricopa County, actually picked up four or five or 96 votes or something. So that was their big headline. Arizona audit shows Biden gained votes. They didn't read or report on any of the rest of the audit, which showed that there were tens of thousands of ballots that should never have been put into the mix in the first place. Because under Arizona law, you're supposed to have a signature on the envelope carrying the ballot that is, mat that is matched against your signature on file at the Maricopa County Registrar's Office. There were more than 10,000 
ballots that either had no signature at all, a straight line, or even under the most uh, expansive view of verification, did not qualify as a signature. The margin in Arizona between President Trump and Joe Biden was 10,457 votes. And there were more than 10,457 ballots that should never have been included in the count in the first place. In Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, which was a real hub of where the Mark Zuckerberg's nearly half billion dollars, $400 million that one man and his wife put into these two C 501c3s that was poured into election offices, turning election offices into Democratic turnout machines. And nowhere was that more pronounced than in Wisconsin, where you had five Democratic mayors. And in Wisconsin, the elections are run by municipalities, municipal clerks, not the county. And you had five towns that were heavily Democratic, Democratic mayors, who got together, did a plan for using uh, nearly $10 million of uh, Mark Zuckerberg money to turn those local offices into Democratic turnout machines. The margin in Wisconsin, the final margin was 20,682 votes between difference between President Trump and Joe Biden. There was an analysis done but I mean, I could go on with Ms. about Wisconsin for hours. There was a was there was a an analysis done by an organization in Wisconsin that's not a particularly pro-Trump entity. In fact, the guy who runs it is a never Trumper. But their conclusion was that there are more illegal votes included in the certified total in Wisconsin than the margin of difference. They estimated that the addition of ballot drop boxes generated a roughly 20,000 additional votes for Joe Biden and none for President Trump. The margin was 20,682. So why do I tell you all this? Because you're not going to read that anywhere unless I find the time to sit down and write a book about it. Because it's, according to the media, it's the big lie. It's the big lie. But you know what isn't a lie? What isn't a lie are the facts. And the facts show that there were problems in the election process. So what are we going to do about it? Because I am not somebody who will sit around and whine. I am not somebody who ever lets, a, who lets people get by with complaining without trying to fix things. So what I've done uh, at the Conservative Partnership Institute is to form the Election Integrity Network. And what we are doing is training people to get involved in their election process. All elections are local. All elections are conducted at the local level. And so what I'm asking each of you to do is to participate in that. To you know, down, go to our website, whoscounting.us, W-H-O-S counting.us, who's counting us, and download the Citizen's Guide to Building an Election Integrity Infrastructure. Because one of the things that I have realized, and I knew some of it, but I hadn't had the time to spend studying it as I now have for the past year and a half, but the left has built an infrastructure to move our voting away from supervised voting, which is in person, at the polls, to unsupervised voting, which is done at home, where all of the protections and safeguards for the secret ballot, all the protections and safeguards against political interference and manipulation of someone's vote, those are all gone. It is literally the left's war on the secret ballot because they want to be able to manipulate and dictate and collect and cast b votes from people that they control rather than letting people make their own choices and be able to vote free of political pressure. So that's why they are intent upon all this voting by mail. 
That's why they want to be able to let you vote by text. Well, let me tell you just what's going on in Florida right now. In three Democrat counties where the supervisors of election are elected, and they're all Democrats, Broward, Palm Beach County, you know, other counties in that area. And they've sent out ballots. They started sending out ballots the 1st of July, and these Democrat supervisors are trying to encourage people to vote by mail by shrinking the number of polling places to try to make, encourage people to vote by mail. And guess what? They put the wrong races on some of the ballots. They, they, and they've already gone out, been voted, and we estimated last night there are about 8,500 ballots that have already come back in that have been mixed in with all the other ballots. And what do you, how do you unscramble that egg? And because they, because they didn't, the, in Orange County, which is Orlando, they left off the school board races in some, on some of the ballots. What do you do about that? And those ballots are already back in the mix. So what we're, and you know how we know about this? Because we have formed local task forces of citizens who are watching every day, and they're the ones who have identified this. And, they, and these are the same supervisors that will not allow the observers, even though the statute says that they're supposed to be able to observe all the processes of voting, that they'll only let them watch 30 minutes a day in one county, an hour a day in another county, the verification of signatures on absentee ballots. So what I am telling you is the left has spent the last decade, and we estimate nearly $12 billion with a B, to build an infrastructure in the election system to support unsupervised voting, to have all of these uh, left-wing entities that file lawsuits. They filed over 200 suits in 2019 and to, in 2020 to challenge and upend the election codes all over the country, the laws enacted by the legislature. And they get friendly judges and collusive lawsuits to get rid of uh, protections, election uh, provisions to protect whether it was senior citizens or uh, to protect against uh, any wide variety of, of, of election chicanery. And if we don't get involved, if we don't reclaim our elections, guess what? We've lost our country. The Declaration of Independence says in the first pr pr paragraph, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. The consent of the governed. And we give and withdraw our consent through elections. That's how we give our consent, and that's how we withdraw it. And they want a system where no matter what craziness they impose upon us, we cannot withdraw our consent because they have manipulated the outcome of the election. And I'll close with this one thing that you need to be aware of. They're now, they're gonna do, they're trying to do with our tax dollars what was done in 2020 with Zuckerbucks. Biden issued an executive order in March of 2021 ordering every federal agency, 600 agencies, to develop their voter registration and turnout plans. Now, we, those were supposed to be submitted last September to the White House, where Susan Rice is overseeing the program, and they are supposed to be registering, they're supposed to be telling the president in the White House w what they're doing to register voters, to create what they call the new American majority, which is young people, people of color, uh, unmarried women, a low-income people. They consider that to be the new American majority. Not my language, that's their language. And they want to then have use our tax dollars to register these people so that when you apply for a student loan, here's your voter registration. Will you apply for food stamps? Department of Agriculture registers you to vote. And then they will give grants of our tax dollars to approved entities, approved entities to, entities to help educate all these newly registered voters. What do you think they're going to educate them to do? So 
that's what's happening now. There's a lot going on. The left is intent. The media. I get. I yesterday was a red letter day. I was attacked by Politico and NPR in the same day because they cannot stand the fact that we are doing something to stop all of this. That we are calling out the left, we're calling out the Democrats, and we are organizing and training and deploying people to become involved in the election process. So I call on every one of you to think what you can do in the election process. Like I say, visit our website. We're going to have a big push for people to become poll watchers and poll workers, uh, become part of the election process, and to be very intent and keen upon becoming part of a local task force to watch your local election office and officials. Because if you're not there, guess who is there? The left. They're there. They're there. In Loudoun County, when they formed an election task, integrity task force in Loudoun County in 2021, and they started going to the election board meetings, just like they've been going, parents started going to school board meetings, they go to the election board meetings, what's the first thing? They sit down, and what do they hear? From the League of Women Voters, the Plague of Women Voters, League of Women Vipers, you pick. Um, they looked and said to our conservative citizens, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? So I'll stop. Uh, I, I think I've gone over a bit. So if you have questions, I'm happy to uh, answer your questions. But we need you to get involved. Thank you. Hey, Dennis. Thank you, Cleta, for being such a wonderful example of freedom. Thank you. I know from the Jeffrey Clark incident that all he did was internal, inside DOJ, normal memos to his superiors, the superiors didn't like it, but they still have gone after him and crucified this poor fellow. And then everybody around you and all the freedom lovers violating your right to constitutional freedoms, First Amendment, etc. I don't know how you get around that except to say, please, God, everybody give Cleta Mitchell money. Well, you know, we, CPI, uh, if you want to help with the legal fees, it's, it's not, that's a big problem. And it's a big problem uh, for Mark Meadows and, you know, so many, so many people. And then pe just young people. That's the other thing that they, you know, young person who has no money got, gets subpoenaed by the D.C. grand jury last week. And so I've been trying to figure out how to help him. But um, if you wanted to contribute to help uh, with legal fees, if you just send something to the Conservative Partnership Institute and write on their legal fees, um, there is a fund there. So thank you, Dennis. I appreciate that. Okay. Oh, there's some right over here. Okay, go ahead. Um, hi. Um, I have a case, um, an ethics case, in the federal court in Charlottesville against Andrew um, McCabe and James Comey and Bill Barr, and um, it, it's on ethics, and I had started it in Orange, Virginia, and anybody can intervene, and it starts goes back to 2014 when Comey did his directive in Virginia that no public corruption could be investigated by the FBI. So um, if you guys would like to intervene in it. I have, my, I have all I can say so. grace over with what I'm doing, but good luck to you. Hi, Ms. Mitchell. Thank you so much for your comments. I'm at Concerned Women for America, and I know you have a partnership with and friendship with Penny and all the others there. And I was wondering, what's a way that groups like Concerned Women for America who have Get Out the Vote efforts can partner with the Who's Counting.us program or initiative that you have to, to make sure our resources overlap rather than duplicate? Well, actually, we were on a call last Friday with Penny Nance uh, and some of her top people at CWA, and we're going to actually you raise a good point because one of the things we're doing is I want to, we're in the process of developing uh, training videos to go along with our citizen's guide to have short modules following the Leadership Institute's uh, pattern, uh, but just five, four to five to seven minute videos that can, about specific things, how to form a local task force, 
how to become a poll worker. What's the difference between a poll worker and a poll watcher? And we're going to make those available and we're going to be conducting online training so that people will know what they need to do and then can go do it. But we're going to partner with any conservative organization that wants to participate. We'd be happy to, uh, if any, we actually sent a letter to the Democratic National Committee asking if they wanted to participate, and I never heard back from them. But, um, but you have to, in many states, most states, you have to be deputized to be a poll worker or watcher, observer, by a local political party or the state party. So we, we recruit, train, and then uh, send those trained people over to the parties to actually get scheduled to participate in the election. But we're working with uh, CWA. We're getting ready to develop a program for them and for any conservative organization that wants to partner with us. But if people aren't part of an organization, they can um, come to our website, sign up, and we'll train you and send you out and tell you what how we'll arm you with the tools to be able to be involved. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Russell King. I believe Wisconsin has uh, outlawed drop boxes, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you think that's a good idea for Virginia and Pennsylvania. I mentioned Virginia because I've seen the drop boxes there. I'm from Virginia. And Pennsylvania because in that movie 2,000 Mules, I believe half those mules were Philadelphia. Well, yes. I mean, drop boxes were a leftist invention for, tw for 2000, I mean, for 2020. Who'd ever heard of that before? And um, yeah, I don't, I think that those should be, I think the Supreme Court of Wisconsin did the right thing in saying that they weren't legal. It's after the fact. But now then we heard this week that there's something called uh, mobile voting where some van is going to come around and, uh, hel and, hel and help you vote. So, you know, so now they're going to be moving drop boxes, and they will stop at nothing. They, they just invent things that are outside the law like they did in Houston, 24-hour drive-by voting. Whatever happened to polling hours? And so when they got rid, when the Texas legislature specifically s passed a bill saying, you hear the hours when the polls are open, and the left and the Department of Justice sued them saying that's vote suppression. So no, those kinds of things we need to get rid of. And Virginia, Virginia is a problem because they, you know, this, the Democrat legislature and the Democrat governor basically got rid of every, uh, every protection and the Virginia election laws. And they've even, this, now this time, this fall, there'll be same day registration, which is a big, big problem. And um, so we have to, hopefully next year, when the uh, Senate is up in Virginia, perhaps a Republican majority will be elected that can then reinstate some of the election safeguards that the, that the Democrats have eliminated. But it's a big problem, big problem. But the only way that the Republicans won, I believe, in, two th in 2021, was because of the thousands of people who got involved in Virginia to be poll watchers and poll workers and to be there and watching everything that was happening. And the things that they caught in advance in Fairfax County and Richmond and Loudoun County with because of local task forces. And those task forces are there, are still there. They're growing. They're now four... I think there are something like uh, 40 task forces across the state of Virginia in every locale. We need more. So there's, there's plenty of opportunity and ample need in Virginia. Yes. Uh, how do you, <clears throat> once a ballot has been cast, um, how do you challenge it once it's already been cast. And what would be the effect of saying, well, there are 20,000 invalid votes and the winner won by 10,000, then you have to throw out the whole election. Yes, that is the remedy. That is the remedy. So how would you do, how would you do that? Well, or it, is this something where you have to do it at a certain time yes. up front yes. or you lose your opportunity yes. the way Trump did. That's right. And we filed that in December, December 4th, and the remedy under Georgia law, if there are more illegal votes, you can establish by evidence that there are more illegal votes than the margin of difference between the candidates, the remedy is a new election. Well, guess what? Georgia was getting ready to have another statewide election on January 4th. Well, there's the cockamamie system they have to have a, a Senate runoff. 
So it was not out, of, but if you can't get a judge appointed to adjudicate the facts, then, you know, but yes, and that happens, and that it's rare, but it does happen, and I just cannot for the life of me understand why it is such, you know, an affront to follow the statute, follow the law, and then somehow, you know, be accused of being an insurrectionist. They now have a new term for us. It's called election deniers. Well, I don't deny that there was an election. I'm not, a, I don't, de there was an election in 2020. I just, I just know that it, the outcome is, um, and I, you know, look, I mean, those referees in the Super Bowl made some bad calls. That doesn't change the outcome of the game, but it does cause you to say, if, but for this call, could it have gone the other way? And that's the way I feel about the 2020 election. And the fact that we didn't get adjudication and the fact that we're supposed to shut up and sit down and go away and not ask any questions is just not going to happen with me. I'm not going to let that happen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, um, Elvin Darden. I had a simple question about the uh, ethics charges that brought against lawyers across the country. I mean, this is part of the thing in the American system. It, lawyers are to represent one side, and now it's becoming illegal to represent one side, apparently. I yeah. wanted to know how that's playing out and you know, whether there's any kind of guidance that can be provided from the outside. Well, they, uh, the person that they started with and, the, and where they got a judge to uphold it was, and ha was Rudy Giuliani to have his license suspended. And, you know, and they, they take it to these jurisdictions where you have these left-wing judges. And, you know, that's a whole other thing that we could talk about are the problems in our judicial system where you have literally, there are, there are court systems around the country where they're just completely biased, where you really cannot get a fair trial. The D.C. courts are what? The D.C. federal courts are horrible. They're horrible. You can't get a fair trial if you're a conservative or a Republican in the D.C. Circuit, in the D.C. trial court or the D.C. Circuit. So, you know, Obama stacked that. Um, so it's a big problem. And the, Rudy Giuliani is the, one, is the one who's already had his license suspended. Um, I just hope that it doesn't happen to Jeffrey Clark or, you know, to others. It's just, it's just appalling that the fact that you can exercise your... Vi your responsibility to vigorously represent your client and then somehow have them come back and, and not do anything unethical, not do anything wrong, but just because they don't agree with your legal theory that they can come back and file an ethics complaint. That's pretty outrageous. But I guess, last question, yeah. Hi, <clears throat> Frank Lusby from Arlington. Just want to thank you, Clayda, for everything you're doing with the election integrity groups, having been part of one in Arlington over the last year. Yes. I c completely agree that it's the grassroots, it's the local election integrity groups that are, can make a difference. So I'd also like to encourage everybody here to try to get involved locally. Um, and also, I just th there was a recent article in the New York Times that about CPI and yourself, and I just thought it was interesting. They had a kind of a derogatory headline, something about the big liar or something. But when you read through the article, 95%, it was like the, the journalist was trying to find something negative, but everything was about getting people out to be patriotic, to look at the vote, to doing their patriotic duty. And the only thing that they could find that was negative was somehow, you know, demonizing the motives of the people got coming out, like just to question that there was problems with right. the election was, was the problem. So I thought... and. Anyway, I thought that was interesting, but I just want to thank you again for everything. Well, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, they keep writing these articles, and we keep reading them and going, well, if this is a hit piece, you know, keep them coming, because literally it, all, it really is talking about trying to train and educate and deploy and get people energized and engaged. I don't think it's helpful, and I always say we've had nine s summits across the country, and and I tell people, this is, these are not rallies. These are not rallies. If you want to go someplace and go, yeah, rah, rah, well, this is not the place to come. This is really boring, tedious stuff. This is 
how do you, how can citizens help clean the voter rolls? How can you form a local task force? And what do you do with the election office? And what are you looking for? And how do you oversee to make sure if they're doing business with left wing groups that have infiltrated all the election offices? And it's very tedious, and it's all day, and people stay all day long, and they sit and they learn and they watch and they listen, and people come up to me and say, "I've never been to anything like this in my life, but thank you." And so. Millions of Americans are intent upon saving our country and saving our elections. And to me, you can't do one without the other. We cannot save this country from this army of leftists if we let them control the elections. And so what we have to do is say, you're going to have to come through me to my county if you're going to try to take over and manipulate the elections in my county. So I call on all of you to join us, be part of that, and help us save our country. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for being here and for presenting on such an important topic. It's uh, my pleasure on behalf of Morton and the Leadership Institute to present you an Adam Smith scarf for presenting here today. Well, join us on September 7th for our next Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast, and I encourage you to RSVP online at leadershipinstitute.org slash breakfast. Uh, Caleb Crandall, will you please uh, step up here for just a moment? Awesome. I invite anyone interested in a tour of the Stephen P.J. Wood Building and the Emerson and DeLawrence Reinch Center for Campus Reform 